Welcome to World Teleport Association's webinar, Five Things, and we promise it's only five, that you need to know about WRC 2023. Um, if you, since you've joined us, we imagine you know what those, world, those letters mean, but it's the World Radio Communications Congress. Last one was in 2019, um, made a lot of big decisions, which seem to be relatively narrow victories for the satellite industry in terms of hanging on to its spectrum. But what happened, of course, afterwards is this, as those decisions radiated outward into national regulation, um, things changed rather drastically. And of course, in Europe, uh, things were already advanced. In the, in the US, we're going through the C-band repack as a result. So coming up is 2023. And once again, we can anticipate that uh, the rest of the world is going to be very hungry for all of the spectrum ultimately that we that uh, we in the satellite industry have made such good use of. So we're gonna be talking a little bit about what can be done about that from the point of view of our community, the teleport operator community um, in the next you know, two years. And obviously this is not something that, that uh, feels like an emergency, but regulation is a, is a long process. And so we wanna make sure to start making our members aware of the importance of this issue and what they can do to add their voice to the discussion. I'm Robert Bell. I'm executive director of the World Teleport Association. Uh, if you're not familiar with us, we do two things every day. One is to advocate for the interests of teleport operators, the independent operators in particular, who make up the core of, of the marketplace. And at the same time, we work very hard to promote excellence among those operators in, op in their operations, in their technology, in their business practices, so that customers ultimately are, are the ones to benefit from all that we do. So after this brief introduction, I'm going to, we're going to hear a presentation from some regulatory experts uh, on those five things that you need to know, followed by a panel discussion and, and some questions and answers with you as well uh, about this issue and about what it is that you could be doing. We can't do the work that we do, including this webinar, without the uh, additional financial support provided by what we call our industry leader members. They are UTELSAT, Intelsat, Kratos, Liquid Intelligent Technologies and SES, and we're very grateful to them for that uh, that extra effort and, and financial support that they put in, into us each year. And one of those uh, one of those in industry leader members, SES, is also providing three of our uh, our panelists today. They are Luis Emiliani, who is manager for Spectrum Development in the Americas at SES, and he is joined by Simone Latore the manager of spectrum development for the uh, EMEA region at SES. And in our Q&A panel, Daniel Ma, who is their vice president of legal and regulatory affairs for EMEA and APAC. Um, so we're looking forward, forward very much to hearing from these very, very qualified gentlemen about uh, what's next. And then joining us for the Q&A will be Jonathan Baer, who's a consultant with MI, LMI Advisors in the United States here, to give us an independent view on some of the major issues um, that are lying wait for us in this. So I want to take a moment and ask each of you, Luis, would you start off, just give us a very quick description of, you, of your background, if you'd be so kind. Yes, sure. Well, um, I've been working um, in the satellite industry since um, 1999, so it's quite a while now. I've, I've been going through um, different roles and I've been with SES for the past 12 years. Um, most recently, as part of the Spectrum Group, uh, dealing with the um, coordination aspects and then spectrum management aspects in, in, in the Americas region. Wow, 1999, yeah, well, you, you, um, you age well, is all I can say. Uh, Sim <laughs> Simone, would you care to tell us a little bit about yourself? Nice to meet you, everyone, even if virtually only. Uh, I'm Simone de la Torre, and uh, I've been with SES for the past eight years in the in the Spectrum team. Uh, I'm uh, responsible for the EMEA, so Europe, Middle East, and Africa um, Spectrum operations in terms of coordination, in terms of application of new filings, and as well as representing the country of Luxembourg at the International Telecommunication Union. And we're going to get uh, a bit deeper into that in the course of the upcoming presentation. Thank you for listening. Well, thank you. Daniel, would you just uh, give us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is Daniel Ma. I'm the Vice President for Legal and Regulatory Affairs for SES. I am, um, well, I've been with SES since uh, 2009 and involved with the, with the satellite industry since uh, 2002, um, uh, taking care of uh, uh, licensing and uh, regulatory policy matters. Well, I've uh, 
actually worked in in every part of the world now so <laughs> Have Congratulations. A, a holistic view. Thank you. And now for the last 18 months, you've been stuck at home like the rest of us. <laughs> exactly. Um, and Jonathan, Jonathan and Pear, would you tell us a little bit about your background? Yes. Uh, first off, thanks very much for the invite, Robert. Uh, I know I'm filling in for Carlos today, so I have some big shoes to fill. Uh, but I'm an attorney by trade. I work for LMI Advisors as a uh, senior uh, consultant. And Primarily, we work on licensing and regulatory issues for both satellite and earth station operators, generally within the United States, but uh, also around the world as well. And, and so we've got consultants kind of strategically placed uh, in, in various regions. And in a nutshell, uh, LMI is a regulatory consulting firm formed to meet the needs of international communications industry. Again, the, the focus being rulemaking and licensing proceedings here in the US. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. So, as you can see, we have some people leading this, leading our uh, discussion today who know what they're talking about, which is very valuable because this is a very complex field. I'm going to turn the, uh, the webinar for the moment over to our friends at SES who have prepared a presentation to take you through the, the high points of the things you need to know about the WRC. So, um, please take it away. Thank you. I will start here. Thank you, Robert. And um, I will, first of all, give you the first duty of going through the slides. So thanks for your patience there. Uh, I'm going to be starting and then I'll be handing over to, to my colleague, uh, Luis, for this, uh, for this presentation. If we can go directly into the next slide, I will take it directly from there. So um, the point of this uh, seminar is really to highlight this uh, important five things to know about uh, the WRC, the World Radio Conference. We want to take it very... Um, high level first and then dig a bit narrower and a bit deeper uh, as the as the presentation progresses uh, therefore the very first part uh, is really going to be about uh, in a nutshell what we're talking about when when we mentioned the WRC, uh, how is the United Nations connected to that and, and basically how are these decisions being taken and how they are affect our services as satellite operators as well as uh, WTA member services. Uh, a bit deeper we're going to be digging into the section B which is uh, basically what is happening in the WRC that is going to affect satellite services and Luis is going to walk us through that. To conclude on a bit more practical term on how can you WTA members get involved and support the efforts that are being made by various uh, sector members and industry leaders as well as uh, member states and countries to support the rightful development or at least a meaningful development of the uh, World Radio Conference study cycle. Um, let's start with section A, therefore if you can please go to the next slide and then the next slide again. Um, thank you so much. So, um, first of all, to talk about the World Radio Conference, we need to talk about the special office of the United Nations, which is called the ITU, the International Telecommunication Union. Um, within the uh, context and the mandate of the International Telecommunication Union, every three or four years, something called like the World Radio Communication Conference, or the WRC, happens. Uh, the happening of this conference is particularly intriguing for uh, for all uh, of, uh, of us who are, let's say, into the regulatory world, because there are very few uh, domains in in, uh, in human doings where where basically the rules are rewritten almost entirely every three or four years because the technology advances and uh, uh, radio communications spectrum is uh, is one of those. So every three or four years. The whole world, approximately 4,000 decision makers from the whole world uh, meet uh, on a one month uh, long process where decisions are taken pretty much on everything that, co that relates communications to uh, uh, satellite communications, as well as radio amateurs, as well as uh, uh, ground communications, as well as terrestrial, as well as, as uh, teleport rules. Uh, everything that is related to radio spectrum in general. The decision in this context are very technically driven, but often they are pushed, they are taken as a result of political agendas as well. So we always need to be to bear in mind of what happens at the World Radio Conference is a good 50% technical reasoning and a 50% political debate that happens there. You take uh, on your side which one is uh, is more uh, valid depending on each. Uh, on each of the topics. Uh, at the World Radio Conference, decisions are taken, if they are taken, by consensus. 
That means that the totality of the participants, which in the case of the World Radio Conference are member states, so countries, uh, must agree onto something. And this is a detail, so this concept of decision taken by consensus is a detail that is often uh, overlooked by people who are not used to attend to the World Radio Conference, where they feel that as long as the majority of parties uh, thinks that the outcome is going to be a certain outcome, then uh, we cannot change it anymore. Well, that's not the case. At the World Radio Conference, we work by consensus. So as long as there is only one party who is not in favor of something that is happening, that party gains a significant bargaining power that can be used and that should be exploited, in fact, in the course of the World Radio Conference. Um, the period that goes in between from one radio conference to another is called a study cycle or a study period, and typically takes three to four years. Um, at the end of a World Radio Conference, uh, Every decision that is taken by consensus is transposed in, uh, in rules in what are called the radio communication regulations. Um, specifically, every change that happens at frequency level is portrayed in the table of frequency allocations, which is the Article 5 of the radio regulation, and where basically uh, for each frequency range, it is specified what is the service allocated and potentially what is the technology identified uh, to be used within that frequency range for the years to come. From the moment when a certain frequency range and a certain services are registered into the table of frequency allocation, so this international table of frequency allocation, then service providers, operators of any sort can make use of that spectrum by applying uh, for licenses that they would obtain through their local regulators. So at this point, we're no longer talking about uh, countries getting use of, I don't know, C-band, for example, but we're talking about operators that are ground or space operators applying through a country to get use of the spectrum. Robert, if you can go to the next slide, please. Now, thanks so much. Thanks a lot. So now, given the magnitude of the scope of the radio regulation, given the fact that we're talking about uh, 3,800 to 4,000 people on a yearly basis and a study cycle that lasts for three to four years, um, you can understand that the work is sub must be subdivided in order to be effectively tackled. And it gets subdivided into what they're called agenda items, these so-called blocks of work um, that basically uh, allow to narrow down the, the, the topics that are tackled so that pretty much uh, only the parties that are really interested and they have an expertise that can actually affect the outcome of such an item have the ability to be heard in a more efficient and effective way rather than if we were just having 4,000 people arguing in, uh, in one room. Most of the agenda items are dedicated to one specific frequency band and one specific service, such as, for example, agenda item 1.3, when we're talking about C-band specifically. Um, while there are other agenda items, such as, for example, the agenda items 1.2, which are now covering multiple um, multiple frequency bands, and they do uh, require a very high level of attention uh, in terms of what conclusions are taken in those agenda items, because you can easily understand how a conclusion taken on a specific frequency range may quickly uh, trickle down onto and affecting other frequency uh, bands. Uh, next slide, please. So, this slide is uh, to go a bit deeper from the previous one to give to get you an overview of uh, of the actual um, uh, agenda items as they are being discussed at the WRC. Now, what is important to understand is that whenever you talk about agenda items, depending on who you talk to and therefore depending on their position and perspective, they'll be able to arrange. Um, agenda items under what they're called defense items or opportunity items or uncertain or neutral items. Now, this list that you're seeing here is the viewpoint of satellite operators and the satellite industry in general. And therefore, the items that we see here in blue are the opportunity agenda items. So agenda item 115, 16, 17, and 19, when we're talking about earth station emotions for GSO and for non-GSO in KU and KA band, we're talking about satellite to satellite links in KA band happening under agenda item 117. And we're talking about potential primary FSS allocation and the 17 gigahertz range in region two under agenda item 119. Then what we have in dark purple, 
purple, so the UAS regulations, is what for us is uncertain uh, because it is indeed covering uh, the bands KU and KA, but we are not clear in uh, terms of being able to project in what the outcome is going to be. We're not clear on whether we're talking about more of an opportunity agenda item or whether this can really become a threat if it's not, it's not well, well handled. Therefore, we're putting more and more resources into following this agenda item 1.8. Uh, and then what we have in, in purple and magenta, the defense C-band are the two, are the three defense agenda items that we're focusing on mostly, which are agenda items 1.2, 1.3, and then topic 9.1c. Um, agenda item 1 to 2 and 1 to 3, we're going to see them very thoroughly through uh, Luis and uh, topic 91C is actually something that is very broad covering all of the bands and it's a generic study um, for, uh, for uh, IMT in fixed, for fixed wireless access in primary uh, fixed bands. Um, now, hopefully this uh, summary uh, is clear. I know it is inevitable that it is not clear the first time that you see it, but hopefully for, for some of you it is clear and it can be used uh, again when returning back to this slide. Um, and if you could go to the next slide right now. I will in just a moment, but I just want to do a quick acronym Please. check. Please. Not everybody's, not everybody's up on every one of these. So GSO is geostationary orbit, right? Geostationary uh, satellites, correct. Geostationary orbit, ESIM is her station in motion. Non-GSO is non-geostationary, so anything that is not uh, 36,000 kilometers from the surface. ESIM is still uh, Earth station in motion. Uh, FSS, we know. UAS is uh, the unmanned uh, aerial services, so ah. we're talking about drones. Um, and specifically in this agenda item 1.8, when we're talking about UAS, we're talking about this control and non-payload communications, also referred to as CMPC. So it's basically the, the remote piloting of, of drones. Um, and um, tell me if the rest is clear, or I'll be happy. Well, yeah, no, it is, IMT is just, is basically, I think of it as, as regulatory slang for basically the whole subject. <laughs> Yeah, IMT. IMT is is the the terrestrial, the high performance terrestrial five right. G five uh, right, exactly. G domain. Yeah. All right, excellent. No, thank you. I just wanted to do that because sometimes we can leave people behind when we don't mean to. So indeed, here comes the indeed. Next That's slide. why we wanted to go high level. So thanks a lot for pointing out this. And uh, so if you go to the next slide, I think it's time for me to pass the ball to to Luis, who's going to dig into C band and KU band a bit more. Yep. Yes, thank you, um, Simone. Uh, now that we know that the packages of work at the WRC are, are called agenda items, I'm going to um, give you an overview of two of, or a block of those agenda items dealing with uh, C band and KU band frequencies. So next slide, uh, Robert, please. In KU and KA band, um, we have both uh, risks and opportunities in this agenda item. So the opportunities that we have around uh, the KU and KA band are around increasing satellite services on those frequency bands, um, gaining access to additional spectrum for downlink uh, from uh, the satellites uh, to, to Earth around the 17 gigahertz and 22 gigahertz band, and of course, uh, um, supporting uh, services for air stations in motions, be them um, air stations on, on ships or on airplanes, uh, communicating with uh, non-GSO um, constellations, with non-geostationary satellite constellations. And of course, the, the question that, that we want to leave you uh, with uh, today is how can you as a member of WTA or how can WTA as, a, as an organization um, help the satellite industry materialize these opportunities? Uh, and now for the risks, if you um, advance, um, please. Then, of course, the risks that are associated to some of these agenda items in KU and KA is a reduction on the spectrum that is available. So uh, don't forget, we have a, a group of agenda items like um, one to two that uh, deal with the potential of identification of new spectrum for 5G networks, spectrum that is very close or adjacent to um, the satellite frequencies we use today. Therefore, there is an increased potential for interference, um, similar to what we saw a few years ago as 5G networks started to be, uh, to be deployed around the 3.4 gigahertz range. The same could happen in the future. Um, 
depending of course on the outcome of WRC23, around the 10 gigahertz range, um, between 10 and 10.5 gigahertz, for example. So there is the potential for increase of interference. And, and of course, the message that we want to bring to you today is, is that you can do something about it. And we'll go through that um, towards the end of the presentation. So next slide, please. Now, speaking specifically about the C-band, which is probably the, um, uh, a topic that is very close to, uh, to members of WTA, the, the immediate risk that we have um, with these agenda items uh, 1.2, 1.3, that deal with the identification of um, uh, frequencies for IMT or with the um, increased priority for um, um, mobile services in, in 3.6 to 3.8 gigahertz, is that of course there is the risk that we would um, experience a reduction in the spectrum that we have available to provide satellite services, right? So we have been using the C band from um, 3.4 to 4.2 gigahertz uh, with different um, types of services and, and, and different intensity of use, so to speak, uh, depending on, on, on satellite payloads, of course, and depending on, on, on sub bands within the C band. But we have been using this band for a while and there is an ecosystem of uh, services and solutions. There is ground uh, technology available, there is there are antennas and modems and, and radio frequency devices available, there are over 60 satellites if not more in space providing global coverage, provide, providing hemispherical coverage, we have HTS satellites providing uh, spot beam uh, for gateway access and so there is a, a big ecosystem providing lots of uh, technology solutions from video to enterprise to emergency. And all of these solutions um, could be put at risk uh, of inter increased interference from 5G uh, or mobile stations um, deployed in the bands 36 to 38 gigahertz. So we would have um, um, issues that you already are familiar with, um, you know, saturation of the LMB, uh, the, re the, the requirement for frequency uh, separation, the requirements for protection distances. And um, among we know, based on the experience of past study cycles, um, this is not the first time that, the, that we have gone through this. We, we went through this analysis with WiMAX and we've been going through this analysis uh, both uh, within uh, the ITU and also as part of uh, consultations and, and regulatory decisions that made uh, by, by each country. We know that sharing the spectrum is, is challenging because uh, first the uh, receive chain of the air stations is very sensitive, right? So the signals coming from the satellite, as you very well know, are very low power. So we have a low noise amplifier with high gain that could be very easily um, saturated by um, high power signals coming from these uh, base stations, whether they are sharing the frequency or they are adjacent to it. Uh, and we also know that because in most cases we have um, distribution services, we have TVRO receive stations that do not require um, a specific license from a local regulator, uh, we don't necessarily know where those stations could be. So these stations are ubiquitously deployed. And, and when one of the effect, most effective mechanisms to protect their stations is a protection distance, how can you guarantee a protection distance if you don't know exactly where all the potential interfered stations are. So that's why it is impractical to, to guarantee and enforce a protection distance uh, in the case of receive-only services, or television and radio distribution services, meteorological um, information distribution as well. Uh, and, and this is why we see this um, as, as not an impossible task, but certainly a difficult task uh, to guarantee that spectrum can be shared without protection uh, mechanisms. Um, please, the next slide. And, and as we talk about uh, this, and, and this is also something that can be um, also said for um, other frequency bands, there are different levels to the discussion. As, as we look at what's happening um, across the world uh, in the lead up to WRC, we see that there are three levels to the C-band conversation uh, specifically. The first um, is the regulatory exploration. So countries, regulators want to look at what can they do to optimize the way they assign uh, spectrum, um, the way they manage spectrum, or if they can introduce new applications on existing spectrum. So they, they ask a question, they start a consultation around the topic of what is the best use of our spectrum? And, and we have seen this happening in Latin America, in Argentina, in Mexico, in, in Costa Rica. I think most recently Argentina is doing this, raising the, I mean, asking these type of questions. What would be alternative uses for this band? How can we reallocate this band? What is the impact? What do you think? 
then there are um, the next step is once the uh, decisions have been made is how can we achieve sharing if we decide to move um, uh, to allocate additional spectrum to another service be it um, unlicensed uh, like 5g unlicensed or wi-fi or 5g um, um, base stations um, if we provide this if we make this decision how can we ensure that sharing between the existing services, not necessarily fixed satellite services, but also fixed service, um, radio wave links, um, microwave links. Um, how can we share this? What are the technical conditions and mitigations techniques, if necessary, uh, that could help sharing uh, materialize? And the other question is, is how do we then, um, after we make this decision, if we uh, affect these services, if we, um, provide these techniques uh, for, for sharing, what could be the economic impact um, arising from this decision? How do we judge the economic value of these services um, that we are now deploying? Um, there are different solutions for, for different needs. Um, the way we we see this is, is not a one versus the other or a one or the other is uh, certainly um, the, the, the decision should be technology agnostic and there is an opportunity uh, for, for both satellite solutions and 5G solutions to cooperate, work together to bring economic value. Um, but also remember that uh, the, need, the connectivity needs for one, of one country are very different from, from the other. If you look at large countries in Africa requiring access, rural access, uh, and you compare that with the countries like, small countries like Luxembourg for which um, you know, connectivity is um, can be achieved with a fewer number of base stations. It's, it's not the same. So you cannot port a decision from one region and, and say it is, it is applicable to another because all the technical studies done in, region, in that region work. So it is also about the needs of the country, the needs of the market, and, um, and, and, and how do we um, deliver on the economic um, need rather than which technology is, is the next hot technology that should be uh, that should be deployed. And something to, to keep in mind, as I said at the beginning, is this discussions that are happen today around the C-band will very well happen in KU-band and decisions that are made in C-band can be ported to KU-band for further discussion. They cannot be implemented one-to-one -one directly, but they put the seeds for future discussions uh, in other frequency bands. And that, that's what we have seen as well happening around KU and KA identifications. For, for other services uh, where satellite has already um, been identified as the incumbent, right? So, so it is decisions that happen in one frequency start to, to lay the ground for future discussions in other frequency bands. Um, next slide. And I think uh, with this, now we move to the end of our, our part and I hand over uh, to Simone for, for concluding remarks. Thank you, Luis. I will take upon the, the, the questions that, that you raised in your previous points to actually uh, respond in a way that uh, um, is hopefully as useful as possible to the WTA members, which is how can you get involved and whether it makes sense to do so. So if Robert, if you can go to the next slide, please. Indeed. So uh, every time that the decision is taken at a global scale, uh, you can understand that it does take a uh, an effort from uh, a number of parties. Um, some of them are often in line with each other, some others are require a bit more of convincing, but technically speaking, we're always talking within the satellite domain, we're always talking about satellite operators, broadcasters, uh, service providers, as well as uh, industry associations, uh, whether they are space industry associations, uh, such as ESOA, for example, or uh, user industry association. So in this case, that's where where WTA is uh, is located, and uh, the the actual um, important aspect of this seminar is really to to invite the WTA members to understand that um, this is not a game that someone is going to win and it's or is going to lose and it has no effect on the space uh, sector whatsoever this is something that truly requires uh, specifically the next world radio conference the wrc 23 it truly truly requires our efforts together as as an ecosystem uh, not just satellite operators on one side and then the industry associations or another or service providers on another it requires the ecosystem to really get together and to try to influence and to convince 
twist arms for as to as many um, sector members to as many uh, administrations or countries as possible because in the end countries are going to be the ones taking the decision um, but as a WTA member what can you do uh, please Robert go to the next slide which is also the last one so two things as an organization absolutely WTA should be as active as, as humanly possible. It is absolutely critical that the WTA clarifies what is as organiz at organization level their position and wherever an, a similar position is found in other industry groups, for example, GVF or for example, ESOA, the WTA is on top of that by saying, we agree, we are clear, this makes absolute sense and the WTA is in agreement with, uh, with that position. It is also very important uh, that as a WTA, so as an entire organization, um, efforts are made to clarify the importance of the WTA services itself, as well as the members' services to the members' administrations. Um, very often, uh, decisions are taken at the WRC because regulators, local regulators, national regulators, are not aware of the damage they are doing to their local economies because organizations and sector members and service providers uh, are not constantly talking to the um, to the to these regulators so they're not constantly making them aware of yes we're still here we do this for you this is the value we're giving to your community this is the constant benefit your community is getting thanks to us and this is uh, is a critical is a critical aspect that uh, because in the end remember the decisions in the end are taken by regulators by countries so the less they know about our existence as an ecosystem the less they will care about protecting our ecosystem um, last point is to issue regular public statements so not just to the administrations not just to the regulators but public statements for the press uh, making absolutely clear and strong and vocal uh, what are the what are the benefits that uh, that uh, such an organization brings to the environment to the to the communities um, then there is another aspect which is the one highlighted in blue which is something that members of the wta should really do in terms of help shaping the operational condition of mobile so terrestrial or mobile satellite and fss so fixed satellite service um, uh, going forward in this specific case from the explanation of, of luis specifically in c-band we're talking about the fact that worldwide there is a number and a growing number of ongoing consultations between uh, regulators and stakeholders in their countries who are really trying to um, depict and capture what is the real usage of mobile services so terrestrial and fss services so space satellite fixed um, and often regulators are genuinely asking for support from the ecosystem uh, to really understand what it goes on and and for this they issue public consultations uh, we do really uh, incentivize and and ask members of the wta uh, to participate in the debate in your country and comment whenever any of this public consultation is relevant, not necessarily to the industry, but at least when it is relevant to your business. Our advice is always don't consider the debate complete until no more questions are asked. And the moment when no more questions are asked is the day after the WRC 23. Until that point, everything is still open. Let's not forget the consensus rule. We all need to agree to get to an outcome. Uh, lastly, uh, please, we invite you to connect with, uh, with other members and to other industry associations, uh, as well as to other slices of the pie that I was showing you in the previous, in the previous presentation. Interact regularly with, uh, with satellite operators, with satellite service providers, um, so that uh, we can create a sort of like mass effect and, uh, and uh, great, get a greater, a greater uh, negotiation leverage. Uh, having said that, um, Luis, you've been following consultations very closely lately, so uh, perhaps you, you may want to add something on the public consultation aspect before we close the presentation. Yes, uh, thank you, Simone. Indeed, there are um, two consultations going on right now in, in, in Latin America that deal with technical aspects associated to power levels from uh, terminals in the five uh, in the six gigahertz range. 
particularly Brazil and Mexico are looking at that. And there have been other general consultations on spectrum use. Uh, Argentina, I think, uh, has either recently closed or is about to close a consultation on what should we do with spectrum, which is an example of the first question I, I, I put to you uh, in, in my slides. Uh, so there are opportunities today to continue uh, contributing to the discussion. So I invite you all, um, wherever you are, to go to your uh, regulator's website, see what the open consultations are and, and bring that up to uh, to WTA as a group, as perhaps as a group you have a, a stronger voice uh, to comment on. Thank you. Thank you, Luis. And um, well, therefore, Robert, if I remember correctly, we can even close this presentation. I want to thank you all for for your attention and uh, certainly opening the floor for questions. Thanks a lot. Well, thank you both, Luis and Simone, for uh, sharing all that you did. It was an excellent briefing to get us started on this. And now we're going to start having the fun part of all this, which is to get some questions and answers going, both with our panelists and with members of our audience as well. So um, I want to turn, we've heard a, a great deal from uh, Simone and from Luis. We're going to be adding uh, Daniel Ma to this discussion as well. But first, I want to hear from Jonathan, Jonathan Baer, who's uh, been listening to all this. And Jonathan, my question for you is, after hearing this briefing, how does it generally align with the, the advice that you're offering your clients? Thanks, Robert. And thanks, Luis and Simone. Uh, I, I think, you know, from a baseline level here, my understanding of these issues is coming from assisting value add service providers in the satellite industry, earth station operators, and uh, small satellite operators. So really looking at the, the national level here. And I guess I would highlight after that, that uh, presentation, the importance of the national impl implementation of these WRC radio regulations and uh, the need for industry stakeholders to get involved early uh, in the WRC process as well. Uh, I, first of all, fully agree that uh, getting as many incumbents together and many uh, stakeholders together uh, builds not only consensus, but also uh, provides more support for at least uh, influencing decisions that are ultimately made at the WRC. So uh, as Simone mentioned, uh, the WRC runs on four-year cycles, and uh, from the moment one WRC cycle ends, uh, national administrations, interested stakeholders begin the process of developing positions on agenda items for uh, the very next WRC conference. I think the, the U.S., for example, has established a, a docket uh, similar to the consultations Luis was mentioning, uh, and these the docket effectively covers all of the agenda items and uh, industry stakeholders and government representatives also uh, get together and effectively determine what the national position is going to be. And this is true for the U.S. and it's also true for uh, this process is effectively mirrored in other countries and regions around the world. So satellites, of course, make up a, a small proportion of those stakeholders because we're, we're talking here about all of the communications industry. But um, it, is, it is critically important that Parties get involved as early as possible in order to uh, in order to effect effectuate a difference in some of those positions that are ultimately taken by uh, the the national administrations. And again, those national administrations are the the members who will be uh, driving that consensus at the WRC. So one one of the things. Sorry, can I, can I, can I just want to ask you for a point of clarification because you've already mentioned it. But one of the things that that people can be confused about is this is the relationship between what happens at WRC and what happens in national regulation, right? Because they're they're not necessarily the same thing. That is that is very true. They are they are not the same thing. And so there I would look at it as sort of parallel paths. You have you have uh, what happens at the WRC, the regul regulations that are the outcome of the WRC. And then you also have uh, the kind of the next step, the agenda items that are set up for this for the very next WRC. And once those radio regulations are implemented, there's, uh, you know, it's, it's part of a treaty and all member states or member nations are obligated to, uh, to implement. And so that it's that implementation process that really happens at the, the national level. And ultimately, you know, through 
the basically because the implementation process is is nationally based you know it takes various lengths of time depending on the administration um, obviously different regions around the world uh, implement things a little bit differently there are different considerations i think as luis was mentioning and so you can end up with you know varied outcomes of implementation uh, at, at the national level even though you know you have uh, the the WRC outcomes that they're they are required to implement, and that's that's usually a factor of the fact that these uh, these processes, the implementation, takes a number of years, and it also requires the the input of stakeholders and uh, government organizations within those those administrations. Yeah, and I so guess, as, as the American humorist uh, Will Rogers said, if you ever think that life is passing you by, just visit the post office. Exactly. That's a very American joke because Europeans like their post office. Um, let me just turn to the everybody here for a moment, give you a voice. I mean, let's just talk about what happened last time in 2019. How do you think that the industry in space and on the ground handled the outcomes of the last WRC and the subsequent regulatory actions? I mean, where where have there been big challenges and where have solutions been successful? And I don't know who wants to go first. Actually, Let me jump in Dan. on that one. Yeah, I was going to say, let's hear from Dan. Yeah. So um, the bottom line with, uh, with, with what happened at every WRC, <laughs> including the last one, um, from our perspective, is that the, the, the terrestrial appetite for satellite spectrum just continues unabated, right? So following every WRC since at least 2007, um, the terrestrial industry has continued to pressure national regulators to reallocate more and more spectrum for uh, for mobile use, you know, for terrestrial uses. Um, and they've done so whether or not the WRC um, has identified a ban for uh, for such uh, for for IMT use or not. And here's where I sort of um, uh, you know. Uh, disagree a little bit with Jonathan in saying that the, the, the these are that the, the national level and the WRC levels are parallel paths, you know, because that 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 implies that the two don't meet. Um, what's actually happening is that you know the nation states shape the WRC agenda and its work uh, and the outcomes, and then they you know after the WRC they 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 would they would implement it, but it's very much a dialectic between what's what's happening at the WRC level and what's happening at the national level. Um, but this also means that um, this provides everyone with an opportunity to intervene because we're all have stakes. We all have stakes. We all have an interest in what's happening at national level regulation. Um, and um, that is where, you know, as my colleagues have said, it's important to make uh, one's interests known um, and understood by the regulator and the policymaker so that um, they can be taken into account when nation states are developing their positions for the WRC uh, and in making decisions about um, about the spectrum that we use. So anyway, to come back to this, uh, I've sort of uh, gone off on several tangents there, but um, <laughs> the, the idea that, um, that that terrestrial appetite for satellite spectrum con continues, is it's very clear, right? Um, even though hundreds of megahertz of extended C-band has been made available for 5G, and over 17 gigahertz worth of millimeter wave, I'm not talking about the spectrum frequency, I'm talking about the amount of spectrum, 17 gigahertz of millimeter wave has been made available for 5G. Um, the mobile interests continue to push, as you can see from the WRC agenda for 2023. They're continuing to push for more and more of the standard C. Um, and they're not even bothering with the WRC for, uh, for millimeter wave. They're continuing to push for 28 gigahertz, despite the fact that they've just been given 17 gigahertz worth of spectrum to, to play with. So um, the challenge for us as a satellite industry, as, as being part of the satellite industry, is to remind um, uh, policymakers and regulators that we continue that we are providing important services and that these services are worth protecting, whether it be connecting the unconnected, or delivering the Olympics, you know, or providing disaster recovery. These are important services that need to be protected, um, and that we need spectrum to deliver these services. And the other thing that we need to, need to remind regulators of is that, you know, a huge amount of spectrum has already been made available for IMT, usually 
typically at our expense. And it would be good to see that, you know, some of the spectrum that's being allocated for, 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 for mobile uh, be licensed and built out before uh, they try rating our, our spectrum cupboard again. Um, so I think those are the kinds of things that we, that, you know, th that we as an industry need to do. Um, it, it's, it's a difficult challenge because we're much smaller than the terrestrial interests that we're up against. But that's, that's what we need to do uh, now and in, and in between WRC cycles uh, and not just accept WC, WRC outcomes as you know, something that just comes from above. It's something we can influence. Yeah, thank you, Daniel. It's funny how these are all exactly the same. I remember all of these talking points from 2019, and, and I guess you just keep saying them over and over again and hope for the best. Um, a question from our audience, and this is a very big topic, and I don't want to spend our last 12 minutes talking exclusively about this, but something that's different this coming cycle from the previous one is that NGSO is going to become you know, much more of a reality in terms of services. Um, are there particular things that ground, you know, ground segment providers as well as satellite, satellite operators should be mindful of uh, in this next, well, in this, during this study period and running up to the next, uh, the next conference? And I don't know who wants to answer that. Go ahead, Simon. Perhaps I can uh, I can take this one at least at the beginning. Um, yes, indeed, uh, not just always becoming uh, more and more of a hot topic, and thankfully so. I mean, there is uh, real reasons why NGSO constellations will make sense, and it's going to be more and more the case in the future. Um, concerning what would be the impact? Well, we've seen on the WRC23, there is a big conversation for the non-GSO eSIMs, so the Earth station in motion that is critical. So the possibility to uh, to allow non-GSO um, constellations to connect directly with with uh, stations uh, such as uh, Land Mobile or Maritime as or Aero, Aero um, stations, right? So um, it is absolutely uh, important this WRC because in WRC 19 the same exercise was done for GSO uh, eSIMs, uh, Earth Station in Motions. Well, now the the the, the transpose is happening for the for the non-GSO, which still actually means that uh, the world is still looking at GSO as a big thing and non-GSO as an upcoming thing uh, as it comes the the, the cycle or the, the following cycle uh, but uh, but these two this two uh, the size of the discussions is certainly equal in magnitude and in importance uh, for what concern ground um, operators and teleport operators um, there is indeed something that is um, obvious, but it needs to be considered, which is the fact that as non-GSO will come more and more and become more and more of, the rea of a reality, non-GSO constellations will have ground terminal requirements that are five times, ten times, fifty times greater than, than GSO operations, right? So um, the relevance of the ground infrastructure is now not just a matter of linking to a satellite uh, that can be done with multiple redundancies, but but it's a matter of uh, it's it's an integral part of what is the latency that these non-GSO services can give to can give to the customers. So I I'm very curious to follow the, the 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 discussion, the evolution here, and I would be if I were you as well as WTA, because the non-GSO is going to be a big driver of uh, or could be a big driver of. Uh, uh, a greater and greater relevance of an even further re relevance of the ground infrastructure providers. Absolutely, and also, you know, the fact that it's that it makes headlines, I think, is going to help us all in this process. Um, I want to turn just turn to a, another topic here because uh, see, we're coming up about nine minutes to go. Um, one of the factors that affects uh, teleport operators as they think about this, we actually did a survey back in December 2020, and if you're you're listening to this and you're a member, I recommend you go to our website and just look for that. Um, it was it was all about you know what what uh, teleport operators actually what's their experience been with mobile interference, uh, and it had some real surprises in it. But I want to pass by that because. One of the issues that teleport operators have shared with me is, look, I, I don't own these spectrum licenses. I, you know, they're they're owned by satellite operators, insofar as they're owned, um, and therefore I don't really have a voice when I'm going to my national regulator. They don't really kind of listen to me because I'm not. I, they don't regulate me. 
Um, what would you say in response to that? And I'm going to start with Jonathan because I'm sure he has, he's got to deal with this this kind of response fairly often. Well, well, I think you're you're exactly right that that does seem to be the way operators are thinking about it. I mean, typically uh, these issues are led by satellite operators rather than other industry players, uh, primarily because industry relies on satellite operators to protect the regional and global spectrum access rights. Uh, satellite operators have billions of dollars at stake. And so, uh, you know, I think from that you know, basic monetary perspective, it sort of makes sense that they have a little bit more invested. But service providers and teleport operators, you know, they have limited service areas and are typically, again, focused on the national, um, the national licensing aspect of this. But what I would say is that, uh, you know, while it's true that that's the, the normal setup, and the C-band proceeding in the U.S. is a very good example of how the uh, the regulators treat satellite operators rather than the the earth station operators. Uh, earth station operators also receive licenses to transmit in the bands in which they operate. KUKA bands being an example, um, and I think you know that that provides them some voice to to uh, or some standing to provide a, a position in the WRC process. Now, whether or not they plug in at the, the national level uh, in the, as I was describing earlier, in this early process with the national administration and, and sort of developing a member position versus attending the WRC conference, I think that's a decision that needs to be made uh, in, the, in the business case for each individual organization. But uh, certainly the way they can do that most effectively is by plugging into organizations like the WTA and then also uh, uh, other regional organizations in order to develop a stronger voice. It, it may be that the individual interest is too small, but by working together, uh, the interests of the earth station operators can uh, play a larger role. Because indeed, as Daniel was saying, it is, it is critical. And I think as Simone pointed out, uh, for NGSO broadband systems, earth station operators are going to play an increasingly large role, especially for the, the large pipe they need to provide for these services. A uh, quick question from our audience that I'll squeeze in here and, and somebody can speak to this. Is Q and are Q and V bands you know, on, on the agenda and what's the defense strategy on that for satellite operators? Who's, who, wants to, who wants to answer that? Um, no, I can take it because I would actually connect a bit also the, 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 um, to the previous question, which I think is very relevant, and to build upon Jonathan's um, answer, if you don't mind. So starting from the QV band part, so to give immediate uh, satisfaction to the, to, the, to the party who asked the question. Um, so QV band were a big discussion in, uh, in, the, in the past World Radio Conference as well, and, uh, and uh, are continuing to be a, um, now a discussion at regional group level mostly, because as, a, as Jonathan was explaining, when we're going after the World Radio Conference 19, then uh, various uh, toolkits and regulations and needs to be done at regional level as well as as well as national level um, and um, yeah they are indeed a big talk also among satellite operators we're always uh, internally I can tell you that we're always deba always debating like are we ready for gateway using Qband are we ready for for a user terminal using Qband, what would be the, the the real meaning there? You need to understand that there is a strong value in QB band and the fact that there is a lot of uh, available spectrum, right? So the the sooner the technology will be ready to get there, the more it's going to be interesting for us because it's a bit easier to, I mean, it's less densely populated, so a bit easier to to coordinate. So yeah, they are indeed the big talk. Uh, I'm myself getting convinced very often and why we're even talking about Q band and B band if in the end we don't really know the difference between the frequency bands inside those. But uh, but I guess that's part of the discovery discovery journey. Um, but if you allow me, Robert, I'd like to pick up on the question, on the answer that Jonathan gave to your to your previous question, which is what should we do as as teleport operators? Um, indeed, uh, as Jonathan was saying, technically speaking, uh, as big satellite operators are the ones that are uh, really having a strong influence in power at the at the World Radio Conference, and we do that uh, thankfully very well. 
Uh, now, what is the problem behind that? Is the fact that in reality we're all license holders. Uh, satellite operators are space as are space license holders, while um, uh, teleport uh, uh, associate organizations and in fact teleport service providers are ground license holders as well as uh, uh, market access and teleport license holders. So. This means that if you think about the actual decision process of the WRC, which is first bring the whole world onto the same page by consensus and then transform that and translate that down to the national level, uh, well, if we need to get to a consensus stage, satellite operators are generally more effective because they have more of a greater and broader view. But when we talk about the fact that this consensus is in reality a collection of a number of national positions well a teleport operator in uh, peru is significantly more capable to influence the peru uh, the, the 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 peruvian um uh regulator uh rather than ses for example who is not a, a, a recognized uh, uh, satellite operator offering services with local offices. So I, I think that it is indeed easy to say that, and, and perhaps it is indeed the case, that satellite operators have a greater, uh, let's say, voice, a stronger voice. But I think that if we actually twist a bit this logic and we start working it together, understanding that the reason why their strongest voice, their voice is strong, is because we're talking to many local regulators. Even if we don't have that direct access to regulators that you have as teleport operators, uh, I think we can actually get to a to a very solid uh, position altogether. So that okay, so, so your, your, I'm sorry, your, your I've, got, I've, got to, I've got to bring you to a close here. I'm um, so Please. so the advice is. Yes, the satellite operators certainly have a big voice, particularly on this international level. But but teleport operators doing business in a country have got a lot to say and a lot of a lot of potential power. So we have to leave it there, unfortunately, because we're running out of time. Um, but I do want to well, first of all, I want to skip my questions that I'm not going to get to question my chance to ask. But I do want to thank very much Luis Emiliani, Simone Letore, Daniel Ma, and J Jonathan Bear for sharing their views with us in this very informative presentation as well. Looking forward, in, uh, on October 7th, we will be out in Mountain View, California, uh, presenting a panel on comparing terrestrial hardware requirements uh, for LEO versus traditional HTS transmissions, which, you know, it doesn't sound quite as exciting as it's really going to be, I just want to say. Um, and then coming up in November, we'll be publishing a report on how to profit from customers' digital transformation, which I'm looking forward to very much. Um, there is this massive change going on in the world, and we as teleport operators can either become among the leaders of it or we can be left behind. And uh, I know which one of those I prefer. And then in December, building a better knock, because with all the changes we're talking about, uh, Network Operations Center has got to keep pace. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank, again, thanks to our speakers and panelists for their contributions, and we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Mm -hmm.